guest today is Bergenald Rash. He's an American clarinetist now based in Ireland. His career has taken him all over the world and he's as comfortable on the stage as a soloist, chamber orchestral musician. He's co-founder and artistic director of Viva Musicale, founding member of Decus Ensemble and member of Chinique. How are you? Hi, I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for joining me today. No problem. You're welcome. <laughs> so tell me, whereabouts are you in this crazy lockdown? Where are you staying? Well, currently I'm in, I'm in Kildare. I live in Dublin, but I'm in Kildare. I met a friend's house in the middle of the country. Um, and it wasn't actually intended for me to be here. I only came to visit, but the lockdown hit. And here I am. Um, but it's been very fortunate for me to be out here because it's, you know, like I said, it's green space, it's the country and fresh air. And I'm kind of removed from, I guess, the day-to-day -day kind of grind of what the city has come to right now with the lockdown and now the reopening. So kind of that, that stress and pressure is kind of relieved for me. So I feel very fortunate in that regard. And are you planning to go back to Dublin soon or? At some point, yeah, I just haven't figured out when. Um, it's It's... Yeah, I plan to go back. I just don't know when I'm going to go back. Yeah, no rush. So I still have my apartment there. I still have my flat or whatever. I just have to kind of like sort when I'll get back over there um, when's feasible for me. Um, so, yeah. And tell me, like, when the lockdown happened, were you in the middle of a project or? Yeah, actually, um, that's really a good question. Um, what happened, we were, well, we, I, I played with an orchestra, Chinook in, in the UK, and we were getting ready for our US tour that we had coming up. Um, we were going to go to Los Angeles and Santa Barbara and San Francisco, um, New York, I believe Michigan, Canada, um, DC, Kennedy Center, and we were going to go to all these venues and give our US tour, our US debut, but of course that got kind of put on hold. Oh, God, that's a big tour as well, that's, that's gutting. Yeah, for real. I see my family and friends. Oh, okay. yeah. And how, how is your family? They're all in America, are they? Yeah, they're all in America. They're doing fairly well, so I'm very grateful. Like, they've been able to kind of isolate as well. And even though the states are opening up and doing some really crazy things over there, they've been able to kind of protect themselves. So I'm Good. very happy for that. And then I wanted to ask you about the Chinooka Orchestra anyway. Some people might not have heard of it. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what they do. So Chinake basically is a predominantly black and ethnic minority orchestra based in the UK and London specifically. It's an associate orchestra of the South Bank Center. And um, its primary goal or initiative is to highlight and uplift the voices of classical musicians of color in and around you know, the UK and, and the Europe specifically. Um, and so it's made up of a lot of different musicians from all over you know, the EU um, and of course the UK. And it's just a really great initiative to kind of, you know, show that the artists exist, that we're there, we're out here. Um, the dearth of, of representation in, in classical orchestras is not because of a lack of talent. Um, so it's just showing that we exist, we're here, and we have lots to say and lots to offer to the field and the profession. And, and how, how does it, I mean, what does it mean to you to play in an orchestra like that? Is, is there a different kind of energy to say if you were playing with the RTE symphony or somewhere like that? Yeah, I'd say so. I think um, because of, you know, the relative newness of the ensemble and just the demographic of the ensemble, not just in terms of, you know, ethnic identity, but also in just how we engage with each other as colleagues and friends and then having been like, of a because the orchestra isn't, a, of, isn't filled with a whole bunch of like older musicians. It's a pretty, you know, youthful group. Um, and so I think that adds the excitement and the energy that we bring to our performances and our concerts. Um, there's a sort of a newness to it and a freshness to it because of, I think, this energy that we bring. And also just the love that we have for each other and the joy of playing together, I think, kind of comes together in that you don't have the sort of stodgy sort of sit back. I've been in this position forever. I don't enjoy this anymore. That sort of loss of the, the enjoyment of playing music, realize that it is play. And um, so I feel like through Trinity, we get the opportunity to kind of re-engage with that play aspect of music and just kind of make something together fresh with these various ideas and various schools of thought and playing coming together. Because you have to realize like Trinity is made up of, audience, uh, of, of orchestra musicians from all over, <laughs> the, from US, the UK, Germany, you know, Sweden, um, Italy, wherever, just coming together. 
and friends. So we have all of these different people with different backgrounds, different training experiences. Some of us are soloists in our own lives. Some of us are orchestra musicians. Some of us are chamber musicians. Um, so we just have all these different experiences kind of coming together. And it creates this, this energy, this excitement that I think is hard to, to re replicate. Yeah, it, it does. I, I, when, when I've watched um, performances, it, it reminds me of like when you played in a youth orchestra and it was like the first time you'd ever played a Beethoven symphony or something and it was just so exciting. It, you, I mean, you guys really capture that sort of feeling, don't you? You just, it's we, we, great. I think we try to capture that sort of excitement and keep everything fresh. Um, and I hope that the results don't sound like we're the first time playing Beethoven. <laughs> no, that's not what I mean. <laughs> um, we definitely have that sort of excitement, like, oh my gosh, we get to jump into this. And I think it's also because we get to jump in it together for the first time, you know. Very few of us have played, if any of us have played together before. So when we come together, oftentimes it's the first time we've ever played next to the person with us, particularly the, the first couple of years when we, we were doing it. So it is that, it does have that newness, that excitement to it, that frisson of this kind of novelty of meeting new people and having to put together a great product in a short amount of time it's so refreshing isn't it it's, it, it's that, that level of excitement when you have that with fellow musicians i just think yeah. wherever you can grab that you have to hang on to it it's brilliant yeah, for sure and it's something that i think all of us are very you know committed to um and wanting to preserve what i love about chinica as well is is the emphasis on education so there's a junior orchestra that works in close connection to the main orchestra isn't there are you involved in that, like mentoring young people? Well, we have the Chinookay Juniors, and um, I myself haven't been in to mentor, but a lot of the projects that take place happen in the UK where, I, where I'm not, or so if, it, if there is an opportunity to mentor, I'm not often present to do so. But members of the orchestra do mentor. Um, they coach, they were just on um, Britain's Got Talent. And so some of the um, symphony orchestra musicians were with the juniors mentoring them through that process. Um, there was, because uh, we've been at the proms, and so the proms we did, I think last year we had some juniors with us playing and so that was a great opportunity to kind of interact with the junior players um and so yeah, in that way there is that sort of relationship between us and we're continuing the, the dialogue of how we can you know do more mentoring and more outreach with our junior orchestra as well as the community at large and i mean as as a musician um you know obviously we all do those sort of um mentoring schemes as we as we grow up through the ranks how, how important do you think it is for young black and ethnic minority people to actually be sitting next to someone that looks like them? Do you think that's a really important thing? I definitely think there is an advantage in being able to see yourself in, you know, in the profession you want to do or being able to see yourself in, in the people wanting to do what you do. You see what I'm saying? I think there's a relationship there of mutual respect and support because you see yourself in that person, that person sees themselves in you. And there's also the sort of idea that if they can do it, I can do it. And then when you when you do see people who, who aspire to what it is you're doing, I find that you take the job more seriously and you really work harder to kind of present you know, the best of yourself and the best of the, the profession to these people when you can so that they continue that sort of passion, that drive. Um, and, and I just think it can't be understated the importance of representation in this, in this way for educational aspirations and such. Oh, absolutely. And, and now you're living and so settled in Ireland. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, our population is becoming much more diverse, which is fantastic. And I just wonder, you know, how, how can we reach them and, and encourage them into classical music? Because, you know, it, it kind of feels like we're struggling as an industry anyway in this country. It would be great to sort of give that a new boost of um, excitement um, from young people. How can we reach them? You know? Well, I think there's a couple of, of points to that that should be addressed um, first. There's not just the, there's the nationality issue, you know, this idea that's, that classical music serves a certain population of people. There's also a socioeconomic issue as well, um, just the cost of classical music. And also the assumption that people from a certain background can't afford this sort of artwork is then these sort of things that kind of work in tandem. Socioeconomic and then ethnic issues, racial issues that kind of compound and conflate this problem. So I, my, my idea would be if I would have to sit down and think, I would first thing I would say is like you know making act, music, classical music accessible, and you know not it's not the idea because I feel a lot of times we talk about this and we try to speak as if classical music is this elevated art form that needs to be dumbed down so other people can do it, and when we speak like that, it has a tendency or the connotation that these 
the other population people who aren't involved in it are some way not smart enough. And so we must make it accessible to these people. And so it's kind of disabusing or disavowing ourselves of this, this idea, this notion, and realizing that we're all, you know, able to take part in music. We all love music from wherever we're from. And it's, it's, it's universal in that respect. Um, it might not all be the same music, but it, music is universal in this way that we can all appreciate it. And so then addressing our own sort of baggage that we bring to this conversation, whether it be from an elitist perspective or a racist perspective or a conflation of like socioeconomic issues, and then reaching out authentically to the populations that we want to target, to the people we want to invite in and do meaningful work on that end, not just at the student level, but also the adults, the people who are gonna be bringing these kids to the concert, you know, creating meaningful, you know, relationships with the people we want to come, which I hope is everybody. Yeah, no, I've had that conversation with um, people before, actually. It's interesting that, you know, we, we tend to focus on how do we get young people to the concerts? How do we get, yeah. well, I mean, their parents have got to bring them or they're probably going to pay for the ticket. So we've got to actually focus on the parents as well. Exactly. We have yeah. to and make it a holistic approach. Like we want everyone, you're all invited, you're all welcome. Exactly. You know, that can run the span of not just diverse programming, which I think is very important, but also a diverse, you know, roster of artists. There's nothing more frustrating for me personally to go through the website of different arts organizations, and particularly like charities groups where you know no artistic directors have the power to handpick who they want to work with and see that it's just so void of any sort of diversity and you're just like I already don't feel like I belong because I'm looking at this and as a knowledgeable musician knowing a lot of the people who are playing this and knowing them personally and thinking where is the relationship you know how is it that you only manage to ask your your white friends to do this job when you know of at least 10 other people who could do the job just as well, if not better. And it's just, you know what I mean? And so it's kind of really kind of holding ourselves accountable in the industry, you know, you know, working with our friends and expanding our friend groups, you know, and we can only, like, we, we I, find, I feel that we only have a chance of reaching out when we start here, you know, when we start acknowledging our own implicit biases, the issues that hold us back, the fears that we have and just reaching out and making authentic connections with people and saying, I don't know the answers, but I would love to learn and grow with you. That's the first thing I think we need to do. And so in order to reach these people, it shouldn't be a top-down approach. It should be us, you know, just talking, listening. What are you looking for? What sort of experience would bring you to the concert hall? What would get you involved in the orchestra? I mean, I know a tons of black people who love classical music but who would just never feel like the, the concert halls where they should be yeah um, from the attitudes people present when they get to the hall to you know just the the, the, the the sort of expectation that maybe you know you can't appreciate this the way that i can because you're x y z like i go to like I'm crazy like what are you doing here with my dreads and my full beard or whatever and they're like what and I'm like you know so it's just it's really interesting I think the first work has to be done internally within on our side and really work to make authentic connections uh, uh, talk to parents talk to communities talk to community centers starting with education I know you're a part of music generation and using those sort of conduits to really just build a love for it and not saying we want you here but saying you're welcome you know, come, you are all welcome, you know, create systems where concert tickets are not just reduced, but we have, you know, free tickets. We have open rehearsals for people to come. We invite schools to come and bring their, their kids to open rehearsals. We go yeah. to schools and have outreach, you know, we create these summer lunchtime concert series where parents can come, you know, and bring their kids in the middle of the day or on the weekend, you know, have just, we have to think creatively and not function so much as a, from a business model, but from a community model, you know. And, and I think that's a, a really important, and I'm sort of fuming today <laughs> about the, the new Irish government coming in and, you know, the, the, the <laughs> you might have seen my social media last night, I don't know, I was absolutely fuming, but I, I, I just feel like, you know, the, the four pages they put out about the arts and stuff. It, I mean, half of it is about supporting local amateur dramatic societies um, and putting live music back in restaurants and pubs. And this is their four pages on the arts sector and the recovery of the arts sector. And there's no mention of a national campaign for the arts, 13 point plan, nothing. And I was fuming last night because I was just like, you know, I mean, I have nothing against amateur orchestras, amateur dramatics, they're fantastic. They absolutely have their place in communities and I think they're really important. 
but I do feel in Ireland especially, but actually they're given a much higher sort of, um, what's the word, um, sense of sort of respect actually than the professional artists, which is yeah. weird. Like I, I, I just, I don't quite, I've never really come to terms with that sort of um, disconnect actually within society here. Um, and yeah, I'm not quite sure how we're going to get around that because I, I mean, you know, it has to come from the government. It has to come, I mean, what you're saying is absolutely right, but without the financial support from the top, how do we even start doing this, you know? And I think Ireland has a very rich tradition of, you know, music and literature, and it's always been described as something by the people for it. It has this very popular sort of idea, the, the, the music that we talk about, you know, with the busking on the street and playing in the pub. And like you said, it has a, it has a place in society and I think what we do is we forget about the hours and years of training that go in to do that to provide that mm -hmm. and that that's not the only form of art that is made here in Ireland and that you know if we're going to support one form we have to also then support the other you know um and so maybe maybe it is you know Ireland's attempt to hold on to this sort of grassroots feel of for the country like oh this is the heart of our, our country is is in the people's hands creating music on the streets in the pubs for this entertainment purpose with our jigs and our reels and those sorts of things i'm not sure i'm not irish i can't speak authoritatively on the issue but as you said there needs to be a government approach to also addressing the need to support the arts that are found outside of those venues, outside of those settings. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's a place for all of us. There's a place for all of us at this table, you know, but we have to make the space. And that's, that's a problem because then we start becoming rivals with other artists for resources when they're not that, the, the problem. The problem is the people up top who aren't, you know. <laughs> no, exactly. And then that's the, I mean, we, we are, we, we are in competition all the time, unfortunately, you know, I mean, and, it, and it, as artists, we don't feel like bad about each other, but you know, we're, we're having to try and put ourselves in these tiny little boxes and it just doesn't work. Yeah. You know, and I, I do think it needs to a whole overhaul really <laughs> of how the funding process works and, and everything. But anyway, that's a huge other, because <laughs> a huge discussion point. Yeah, like, I mean, we could talk about the Arts Council and funding systems here in Ireland and we'll probably just <laughs> viral. So <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Virgin, Virgin, I was drawn to you originally because um, actually I, I felt this sort of um, solidarity with you when I was reading through what, what you do, but you, you have, you kind of have your fingers in a lot of different pies and that's kind of how I work as well, you know, with lots of different chamber groups and things like that. So I, I wanted to talk to you a bit about um, the different projects you have running. Um, now, forgive me if I pronounce these wrong. So you've got Viva Musical, yes. is that right? Yeah. Um, and is that mainly an educational sort of project or? Well, it started out um, as a chamber music collective designed to give emerging artists a platform because I've always felt that, and this is, you know, before I could officially call myself a professional musician, I always felt that there was never anything to bridge that gap between me being a student, leaving conservatory or university or whatever, and then going to the professional stage. There's nothing in between to really kind of prepare you adequately, particularly if you don't have the opportunities to, in America, we have um, summer music programs, summer music festivals, and we have, you know, side-by-side -side schemes with a lot of different orchestras. But if you are unable to have access to those for whatever reason, there's never anything there that says, actually, we see you and we support you and we want to, to watch that, that grow. We want to invest in you. And so Viva Music House started out by me and my friend Jorge as a, a means to kind of invest into this demographic that we ourselves found ourselves in at that time, but also felt that always goes overlooked. You know, we talk about early education in music, we talk about the audition process, getting to the audition, but we never talk about that bit in between. And so this was our reason, our, our, our design behind Viva. And so that's what it became. It became just, you know, chamber music friends getting together, arts, artists creating programs and putting on concerts all over. Um, and then when I moved to, I went to move to Spain and I took a step back. And then when I moved to Ireland, I took a further step back. And so now we haven't produced any concerts in almost like, I think maybe three or four years. We've been kind of just holding because um, other things have come up in sure. both me and Jorge's lives at the time. Um, so yeah, that's Vivra, and then I'm also part of Chinake in, in London, and then there's a chamber group called Decus in London that I, I play with, founded by my friend Uchina Ngwe, 
who is not just a fabulous oboist, but also a brilliant researcher. Scholarship is phenomenal. I'm currently getting her, her PhD at, um, tr tr oh, I forget, is it Trinity? I think it's Trinity. Don't quote me, I have to ask her. <laughs> but getting her PhD um, and researching the works of Black British composers. Um, and so she founded Decus and, and has her whole project, Plain Sight Sound, that I'm involved with. And then there's a Cine 12, or Twulf in Germany, which is uh, an opera company that sort of reimagines or does a contemporary setting of traditional operas. And it's scored for a smaller ensemble, a smaller orchestra that I play with every, of every other summer when they are doing pr production. So there's a couple of things I'm involved with in, um, professionally um, in terms of my output musically. It's, a, it's brilliant and I, I love it because that's how my career is as well it's just doing those different and it keeps everything fresh as well doesn't it it's, yeah. yeah and it keeps things just kind of like you're like where am I going to be today <laughs> oh, <laughs> this week? you know that's there's an excitement to that but there's also sort of like I just want to sit <laughs> <laughs> so lockdown's nicer <laughs> it's been very nice just practice and you know sleep and I actually saw, I wonder if you could, because I, I see this a couple of times with wind and brass players, like you're a Devon and Bagani artist, like what yeah. does that actually mean? Because string players don't get this at all, you see. So, um, and I have my clarinets over looking at me. Um, so <laughs> recently I discovered this beautiful brand of clarinets called by Devon and Bagani. They're a, a Brazilian brand of clarinets and they're exquisite and beautiful. And it was this very serendipitous how it all happened. But basically when you're an artist for an instrument company, they supply you with instruments and um, they, they just basically help facilitate, you know, your educational, um, or they support your educational outreach initiatives and your, in doing so, you're spreading the name of the brand and getting, you know, giving them positive representation. So it's sort of a symbiotic relationship between artists and brand where they support you in, in your educational initiatives that further the, the knowledge of their brand and then they provide you with instruments at, for however it's just negotiated with the company. Brilliant. Yeah, so, I have, I've seen on your Instagram photos of your clown. Yeah. Is, it, is it like a dark wood? Is it, is it, it's beautiful. It's a, oh. yeah, yeah, it's the typical grenadilla, but it's unstained. So oh, you okay. can see like the red, because that grenadilla that we normally see is stained black. And so you don't really get to see the fiber that you hold in the sun. And over time, like the, the stain will come off, but these were never stained. So you can see like the reddish color in them. And they're beautiful. Like they're absolutely beautiful. Um, so yeah, and they play well. That's the best part. Like yeah. I, I, I like that they look good, but I love that they play play very well. And like just the treatment I've gotten from Devin Mergani has been really great. I wrote a blog, a, a blog about it, um, about Devin and Bergani, the boutique experience, because they really did give me like this sort of really personalized experience and helping me find the instruments that work for me and my voice and tweaking this and working on that and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, and I keep that's pressuring me to like build an E flat clarinet because that's the next thing I need to do. Ooh, nice. <laughs> So to get the E flat. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And I actually saw um, you, you took part in um, a show at the Arc called The Haircuts. Yes, that was it was such fun. Like I'm, I'm still, it's on my watch list to watch with my son actually because he's yeah. kind of the exact age for it, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Like um, the, the musicians, Leoba and, and Nicola, were so much fun to work with. We got on really well. And Leoba, you might know Leoba Petri. Yeah, yeah. Or Petri, rather. She's an amazing cellist and just such a wonderful person. I just love her energy. So it was great working with her. And then, of course, Thomas Kane Byrne, fabulous actor, you know, pulling out all the stops for all the characters, memorizing the Bible's length in, in text and lines and <laughs> voice changes and blocking. It was great. It was just a really great experience. And I loved that I was able to do it in Dublin because so much of my work happens outside of Dublin. I was very grateful that I was able to kind of be home and go into the city, go into the arc and just work and make music and be supported in that. Um, the faculty or the faculty, the staff at the arc have been super supportive, were super, super supportive and selfless. And it was just great. And of course, you know, you have Tom Lane, the composer of the music and um, Wayne, uh, who, who did the, the, the script and the block and the directing and everything. Just really great artistic team to work with and i had a great time so i would love it, to do it, it looked like you guys actually did you have to play you were playing more than just your instrument though weren't yeah, you? and like, were you doing all the sound I, effects and stuff as well I, were you? some of them so i had three clarinets the e flat b flat a oh i had four clarinets ah. <laughs> e flat, <laughs> e flat a and then the bass clarinet and then i had harp and i had some like shears and scissors and a water bottle and and 
fabric to throw. Like we were all like doing everything. Like if you saw Nicola, the percussionist, he had to run across the back with all the different percussion instruments, like huge gongs that we had to play and harps and, and xylophones and, 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 and um, glockenspiel, just everything. And Leoba, even though she's a cellist, is over there doing it all too, you know, with, with Amazing. You know, flippers and everything. It was great. I mean, they really got us involved in just, we weren't just, you know, the, the, the orchestra, the set pieces. We were actually very much involved in the execution of of the, the show and making it come together and making it come alive. And it was all without conductor. So you're all, you're doing chamber music, but a performance of chamber music, does that make sense? So like, I can't speak highly enough of it. Like, so we're all like having to look at each other and cue and like, <laughs> like thinking about just like the choreography it took to pull it all off, listening to Tom and getting our cues right and looking to make sure we're all together. That's, it was a lot of fun. Like, and oh, I have to yeah, say- no, I, I'd love to, love to do something like that. And I, I, you know, we would, it kind of connects so earlier we were talking about how to sort of how to approach different audiences and how to get them. And I honestly think this is one massive way forward is, is this sort of, I mean, I, I'm, I'm desperate for Musici Island, my, my group to sort of work with dancers and actors and things like that. We've, we've worked with poets before. And I, I think like if you can do as much cross platform programming yeah. as, as possible, it, it's, it's the way forward really. It's interesting to say that because one of Viva Music House initiatives, a part of what we did was to do this interdisciplinary art melding of art forms so that you'd have different things going on from different art forms as the music is happening, inspired by that. So yes, I'm a complete proponent of that idea of just bringing it all together in that whole Gesamtkunstwerk idea that um, Wagner had, God forbid, you know, um, he's problematic in his own right. But like this <laughs> idea of just bringing it all together and creating a, 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 a spectacle, a show that people can get, everyone can get something from, you know. So yeah, then that, it was definitely that, like the arc was definitely, definitely that. Brilliant. And can I just ask as well, you know, I mean, lockdown is, is gradually unlocking, I suppose is the way. <laughs> um, but like, uh, I don't know, like for classical music and music as a whole, like, I mean, we, we don't see we don't see what's going to happen for us just now, do we? But I mean, as as a wind player, how are you? How are you feeling about? Are you optimistic about the future? Because I know there's loads of reports coming out about you know testing on wind instruments and all of this. Like, how much space is appropriate for us? Um, yeah, I haven't actually, and this could be very honest. I haven't actually given it a whole bunch of thought. <laughs> I've just kind of sat back and watched things unfold, and trying to be ready when and if I get the call. Um, yeah. So practicing, but I do find that my friends who are in the UK who spend a lot of their time, you know, there some are very concerned about the idea because a lot of so a lot of the initiatives that are happening I know in the UK are not from the perspective of um, public health and safety, yeah. but from a more capitalistic idea of we need to get people working and need to get these jobs happening again, and so they're possibly risking people's lives by you know reducing the distance and and this sort of thing so in my mind i would love to see you know the governments be like you know what we need to protect these people let's support them financially until we can do so until we can open up instead of opening up before we're ready risking the lives of all of these people so that we don't have to do our part and you know support them in this time of unprecedented you know change and you know just like um shock you know so that's my thing like i feel like a lot of the conversation isn't looking at the government's role in supporting not just the arts, but humanity during this time, but more like, how can we make them take care of themselves or make it, you know, get them in the situation where we don't have to worry about it because God forbid we open up our purses and support these people during a time all of us need to be mindful of health and safety, not just for our own sake, but for our neighbors. So I feel like this idea of global community isn't always working in the direction that I would like to see it working. Um, so that would be my thought on that. So yeah, I, I definitely felt at the beginning of all of this, but I, you know, certainly in Ireland, I hope, hope that the government was sort of putting our health first and certainly in comparison to the UK and US, you know, things were a bit shaky there. Um, but, and I, I really sort of had this positive feeling that this is it, you know, people are going to put the environment first, we're going to put people's health first, this is the change we needed. And as soon as sort of, um, oh, money, money, money comes into it, like it's, it, it feels like we've forgotten it all. And I, I do feel a bit, a little bit despondent about that, but it's a shame yeah. that we can't, you know, this, this was a huge chance for humanity to, and, right. it, and, it, and right. I think with the coronavirus, you know, it was the first time 
it, you know, I think in my lifetime where you you felt that people were thinking worldwide, but we are as one and, but you know, a neighbor is someone in Alaska or whatever, you know, from Ireland, you know, <laughs> and it, yeah, it'd be nice to keep that going. It would be. And unfortunately, you know, people, corporations have taken precedent over people's lives. Yeah. Um, and that's, I find very tragic. And so my concern for my friend, when friends or myself is, even because I know there's been a, like a petition in the UK to reduce the required space from two meters to one meter so that wind players can be together. But I'm like, is that healthy? Is that what exactly. we should be doing? Or, you know what I mean? Like, why are we pushing for that direction? And not saying, hey, we're not gonna be back together for a while. It's not responsible or ethical for us to do this. Let's support our artists. Let's support the people who can't work right now. Let's really do our part to make sure we all come out of this better than we went into it even but that's not what's happening. And yeah. so from there, I'm just kind of set back. Once I realized that was happening, I just kind of stepped back and said, okay, <laughs> let's watch and see. <laughs> because, you know, like, obviously the things that I find are important are not universally important, so. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's a healthy attitude, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, Virginia, I've, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. And, Thank you for having me. Oh, no, not at all. And I, I can't wait, we're already talking about plans to play yes. together in the future so i can't wait for that and you know it's been an absolute pleasure take care and hopefully see you soon yes likewise okay, bye. Bye.